I want to think with you today on the subject of how to grow a healthy Christian life. This day when we stop and think about fathers and, and uh, what they mean for us, we need to remember our Heavenly Father and what the Father did for us. I'm reminded back as to what Father's Day is all about and when Father's Day actually got started. I was looking back and reading the story on that. Maybe you know it already. But this is the 110th anniversary of Father's Day. 110 years ago, at this time, uh, Father's Day began. And it all began because a lady was sitting in church. Uh, her name was Son, uh, Sonora Dodd. She was sitting in church and she on Mother's Day and seeing mothers being honored. And she thought to herself, why did dads not get honored? Why are they not being honored too? And so she came up with the idea of honoring her father on, on this day in history. And it turned around and became a, a holiday that is now remembered in many places all over the world. And as we think about that, what is the purpose of fatherhood? What does fatherhood have unique in it? We're going to be looking at Second uh, John today, and we thank you, Rich, for reading that for us, the, the brief verses there in front of it uh, today. But we're going to be talking today about, from Second John, uh, a story about what John, one of the apostles, felt about what was going on in the life of people. As uh, we think about Father's Day, it's very similar. And God designed fathers to be a remembrance of who He is. And that's exactly what role we have. We have the role of acting like God is to us. And that's an awesome role, as you, as you can well imagine. Without, uh, without a dad, do you know you wouldn't be here today without a dad? Now, you might say, well, my dad wasn't much of a dad, or he might have been a great dad. But the truth of the matter is, you wouldn't be here today. You were born because your dad participated in it. And without him, you wouldn't be here today. So fathers are an important part of our life. And without them, we're here. And fathers are to love us, and they're to teach us. This is important. God gave this for a reason, I believe. And uh, we see that here in Second John today. When we accept a personal relationship by being born with our Father. We accept a personal relationship with Him. He will always be our Father. Whether we like it or not, He will always be our Father. And He will always have that influence on our life in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And when we stop and think about that, it's what we do with that relationship, what He does and what we do, that determines the quality of that relationship. Amen? If your father was a good father and you were a good daughter or son, that is a great, strong relationship and it goes a long way in your life today. It made you who you are in many ways. As we think about that personal relationship, I want you to understand that when you come to the point that God convicts you, that God loves you enough that He wants to have a personal relationship with you just like your father had a personal relationship he wants to birth you again. He wants to bring you into this world in a whole new life than the life you had that your original father gave you. He wants to have the same relationship with you that your father was given. And that is to birth you into this world. And how does he do that? Well, he has to pay a price, just like a father has to pay a price to be able to, to get, bring you into this world. So does God the Father. And God the Father loves you so much that He sent His own Son down, Jesus Christ, to earth, and He took and paid the price. How many of you would say, you know, your father was not all that he should have been? How many of you would say that? That there were areas in which He did not stand up to what He could have been, His full potential. I think we'd all have to admit that in some way, shape, form, or fashion. If we're a father, we'd have to confess that that's true in our lives too, that we weren't all that we should have been, that there's things that we say, I should have been better than this. Well, the Heavenly Father, He is not lacking in anything. And He sent His Son for a reason. And that Son took and paid the price for all the failures of fathers. Every father's failure was paid for. You have no excuse for not having a good relationship with the Heavenly Father because of an earthly father. You have all the reason in the world to appreciate the Heavenly Father because Jesus took and died to pay for any sin, any difficulty, any lacking in an earthly father, 
Jesus paid the price so that you could have a perfect relationship with the Heavenly Father and be all that He expects you to be. Sometimes people tell me, well, I just can't do that. I, I, I just can't forgive. I can't, I can't grow in that area. I can't do that. I can't make that step. I can't be that person that you're te- saying that the Bible tells me I've got to be. Yes, you can. Because Jesus paid the price so that all your sins are forgiven you against the Heavenly Father. And He expects you, in turn, to look like the Heavenly Father, to act like the Heavenly Father, and to forgive like the Heavenly Father. We have the ability as Christians, when we accept Jesus Christ in our life, we have the ability to do everything that Jesus did in paying the price for other sins and for our own sins. I want you to understand that. We accept a new personal relationship with Jesus. That's with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ when we accept Jesus to be the boss of our life. You see, that's the only way it's going to be. Now, if you look back and you had a great dad, if he wasn't a boss in your life, then, my dear friend, you'd missed out on some things that you needed to do. You didn't do everything that he said to do and do it the way he said to do it. You missed out on some great instruction that was there. Maybe you felt like he wasn't qualified to do it. But who in here could deny that the Heavenly Father is qualified to be a a, a father to us in every way, shape, form, or fashion and to do it perfectly? And He took and paid the price for us to forgive any ill will or any problem that occurs in our life so that we can be equal in the love of other people, the love of and forgiveness of other people, just like God the Father forgives us. If we cannot do that, then it says something about our relationship with the Father. Sometimes we look at a, a child that's born in and we say, now, who does uh, he look more like, father or mother? And uh, sometimes we come away and we say, uh, hmm, doesn't look like either one. And uh, we begin to wonder. And we ask the mother, you sure that's your child? And, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty easy answer to say, right? Well, I want you to understand that when Jesus came to live inside of you, if He came to live inside of you, He birthed you and you are a child of God. If you don't act like it, then there's a problem. You may not look like Jesus, but that's your problem, not His. He's a perfect Father to you. As I think about this this morning, I want to take and look at how we can grow in the Christian life. How can we be like Jesus in His Christian life? And I took as my text, as I was studying this week, uh, a passage that spoke to me about this. And uh, I'll bring it to you today. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's over at the beginning of the New Testament. But if you go to the end of the New Testament, before you get to Revelation, you'll find another John. And that is 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, in 2 John, there are only Verses, there are no chapters. There's no chapters. So Second John, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. And it, it's right at the very end of your Bible, as you can see in my Bible. I've got mine open too. Second John there. It's right at the very end there. And there's only two points this morning. We'll be out of here in a few minutes. And uh, when we get through this, we'll see that there's only two major points in here. First major point is that we have to practice, we have to practice the new life that we get by God the Father birthing us into a new life through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of us. And not only do we need to practice it, but we need to protect that relationship that we have with the Father. We need to protect it and stand up for it. As I think with you this morning in this passage and we go to the Scripture, let's pray and ask God to open our minds and give us a clear understanding of what this passage is talking about. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for sending Your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us how to be a Father, to show us how to be a true person of God. Father, to give us the ability to live like a a true Father, not like one that would act like the world, but one that would act like You, Heavenly Father. Thank You for fathers that that so quickly identify with that. But Father, all of us need to come to the point of realizing that we all have, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we all have within us the capability to forgive 
and to take and to live like God the Father lives with us. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing that I would say, and it's your first point in there, as I look down through this, is without your father, without your earthly father, you wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't. And without Jesus Christ coming and paying for your sins, you wouldn't be a child of the Father in heaven. Jesus had to take and pave the way by paying for your sins so that you could be a bona fide child of God. You could be and have Him as your Heavenly Father. I want you to understand, in the vast world that we live in, most people are not children of God. I want you to understand that as a father, there are few and far in between children that are actually my children. I'm the father of very few children. It doesn't matter how many people are in the world, I'm only the father of a few. And I had to personally participate for that to happen. And God the Father had to personally participate for you to become a child of the Father, the Heavenly Father too. And unless you accept that participation in Christ and accept the forgiveness of your sins, you are not a child of God. I dare say that there's some of you in here this morning that are not a child of God. You might want to call yourself a child of God. You might say God the Father is your heavenly Father, but the truth of the matter is He's no more your heavenly Father than I'm the Father of all the different countless people in society out there. I had to participate for them to be my children. Either by by natural selection or by adopting or bringing those people into my Only then can I become their father. I have to take and give something. I have to take and forgive things. I have to take and put things in place for that to happen. And I want you to know that's exactly how you become a child of the Heavenly Father is by accepting what He's done for you and allowing Him to be your Heavenly Father. Amen? First thing we got to do is when we become a child of God is we got to practice. we got to practice. Practice that this Christian life that God has given us. Whether you're thinking of the earthly father and son as I've got pictured up here, or whether you're thinking of the, the heavenly father represented by the church, the church is the gathering together of all of God's children. When God's children in a certain area come together and assemble together, they become the church, they become the family of God. And that's important. That's what we are here today. Now, that's not saying people in a different church or different location are not the same. They are. But we, as we come here together and align ourselves together and make that commitment to one another, we become the family of God, in other words, the children of the Father, right here at this, this location. This becomes a church. The church is not you out there in society. The church is you assembled with those that God has put you together with in worship. We grow when we practice the Christian faith, whichever one it is. We grow as we grow in our relationship with our children. Even as we're older, we can still grow in our relationship as a father to those children. And they have to participate, you understand. And God has done everything He can. He has literally paid for everything you've ever done wrong against Him. It's all paid for through Jesus Christ's death. But you have to accept that and then begin to practice it or you won't look like a child of the Father. The truth is so important here. The truth is not something that we just study or believe. The truth that God is your Father is not something that you study about by studying the Bible and reading a lot of passages and say, I'm in the Word of God. I know that God's my Father. It's not something that you believe and say, well, I believe that God's my Father. It's not that either. It's only when you accept the payment Jesus Christ made to forgive you of your sins that you enter into a relationship with God the Father. Until you're willing to accept that, and Jesus says it has to be done publicly. He said it this way, if you're ashamed of me, to tell other people that you're doing it, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you, he says. And that's no father relationship. You may think you're a child of the father, but 
You're not a child of the Father if you haven't publicly accepted the payment Jesus Christ made for your sins. Look with me at verses 1 through 6 here in this great passage found in 2 John. Now the elder is a person, it's, it's recognized as a pastor, it's recognized as a spiritual leader, usually an older person. It's a person that has wisdom in the understanding of the relationship of God and the church. An elder is someone that, that not necessarily is the pastor of a church, but he's a person of spiritual leadership that brings the Word of God to us and teaches the Word of God to us. Not somebody that talks about great things, but somebody that teaches us the Word of God and becomes like a father. Now, agree with me that not all people that are their fathers are actually dads. Would you agree with me that there are men that have brought a child into this world that are not a father to them? They legally are. We like to distinguish in our culture the difference between a father and a dad. A father, anybody can be a father that sires a child into this world, but a dad is something that he has to work at and build, and you have to participate with that. Now, the elder is representative of God the Father, and the elder has a responsibility to take care of the people in the church. Now, we're writing at this particular time in society when being a church, being a, 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 a gathering of God's people together, was pure and tea dangerous. People got killed for that. And so there are words that are used in here to describe the church and anybody see the word this is, that describes the church in here? Read the words up there. To the to the what? It's on the screen. To the elect lady. That's the church. That's the assembling of God's people is the elect lady. And who are the children that are in her? That's the members. Yeah, that's you. Okay, so the elder, this spiritual leader responsible for this, this congregation, this spiritual leader, he may not be the local pastor, but he's certainly a respected pastor that is teaching them that they look to for leadership and things like that. To the, the elder writes, and he's writing to the elect lady, in other words, to the people that have been called out of the world and have formed a congregation, formed a church. They're called, you're called an elect lady. And the members of the church are called the children. To the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And then he says, I love you so much. And the truth is that I do. And it shows up in the way I act towards you and the, the teaching I give you. And not only I, but all also who know the truth. Now we know in Scripture that there's one person referred to as the truth. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus is often referred in Scripture as the truth. And remember, it is dangerous for a church to meet together. Sounds like today, doesn't it? But I'm talking about it's dangerous for a church to meet together in the day that they were doing this. They came in and killed not only the elder, not only killed the pastor, but they would kill any member in the church that would not denounce Jesus Christ and quit the church. It was dangerous to come together in that day to worship the Lord. But God commanded the people to come together to assemble. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, He said, as so many have done in this dangerous time. There are a lot of people today that say, I just can't go to church. It's too dangerous for me to go to church. Well, I want you to know something. The Bible gives them no excuse whatsoever. In fact, the Bible demands that they do it. The assembling together of God's people ought to be more important than your health. Your spiritual health demands the assembling of yourselves together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, maybe it's against the law in some places. It didn't make any difference. It was against the law for these people too. And they didn't get, catch coronavirus. They got killed. They got shot, knife, head cut off or whatever because they assembled. And it still goes on in societies today. So the Word of God, as we read here in Second John, Second John, continue to read with me, it says that 
because of the truth, and Jesus is known as the truth because of Jesus, it's saying, because of the truth that remains in us and will be with us forever. I want you to understand that when Jesus comes into your life, He's not leaving. When I became a father to my children, I'm not leaving. I may be a poor one, but I'm not leaving. I have to stay around because as long as I'm alive and as long as they're alive, there is a connection whether I treat it right or whether they treat it right. There is a connection there. And when we give our lives to Jesus, there is a connection between us and God the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on to give a, a nice greeting. It's a greeting that, that was common in that day. Uh, in my younger days, we used to write a lot of letters to people. That was the normal way of corresponding. We didn't have cell phones uh, and TikTok and, and Facebook and all those kind of things. We, uh, we wrote letters. And this is the form in which they wrote letters in that day. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God, the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. So it's a normal greeting, and it's a greeting from God coming through Jesus Christ as taught by the elder. The elder, the pastor, is teaching them this and helping them to understand what responsibilities they have as a child of God. Are you a true child of God? I was very glad, it says in verse 4, very glad to find some of your children... Whose children? The elect lady. Who's the elect lady? The church, the congregation. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth. It was nice to know that some of the people in your church actually live like it. They don't just talk it. They don't just put, do it on Sunday morning. They live like it all week long. I see them in the HEB. I see them in the store, in the theaters. I see them all over town, and they're walking in the truth of God's Word. You can tell God's alive in their life. It's, uh, it's interesting, and, and, and I say it humbly, but often in society, uh, I'll go up to buy something or something else, and somebody will look at me and say, you're a pastor, aren't you? And I'll look at them like, how in the world did you know that? But my dear friend, they ought to be saying the same thing about you. You're a Christian, aren't you? I used to think it was because I wore a suit all the time. I mean, 24 hours a day I wore a suit, literally. Uh, I got up in the morning, put on a, a dark suit, and wore it, uh, usually a, a vested suit. And uh, I wore that all day long. Uh, in my early days in this church, in this community, I used to walk the streets every day. For at least five hours a day, I would go door to door, visiting with people, getting to know people, building the church of God. And they could tell I was a preacher a lot of times because of the clothes that I wore. But I believe more than that, they could tell because of what I talked about and the interest that I had in their family and the fact that if they were outside mowing the grass and looked hot and sweaty, I would just say, why don't you sit down and have a drink right now? Let me push the more for a while. And that's just the way it was. That's the way it used to be in ministry is we used to do things just like that. You remember those days uh, right here. Midori does. She was here during those days. And that's the way it used to be. And then things have changed. But still, people ought to recognize you as a Christian and know that you are part of God's church, that you're a child of God. It's kind of like sometimes people would say, your father was so-and-so, wasn't he? Because they see in you the same qualities they see in him. But him. And so it goes on to say right here in verse 4 again, please, I was very glad to find some of your children walking that means living their daily life in truth, in keeping with a command that we receive from the Father. This is not a suggestion from the Father. It is a command. So now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I were writing you a new command, because if, if he was writing a new command, he would be against God. We're not to add to the Bible. We're not to take away from it. Not as if I'm writing you a new command. He is speaking forth what Jesus has taught now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I'm writing you a new command, but one that we've had from when? The beginning of time. All the way back to Adam and Eve. That we love one another. I think one of the most difficult things I see for some people in church, and the true reason for it is not everybody in the church membership are true Christians. 
That may come as a shock to you. Say, well, they've been baptized, they, they've joined the church, they attend regularly. But not all are true Christians. How do you know that they're true Christian? Look at verse 5 again, please. They will know that you're a true Christian. So now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I'm writing you a new command, but one that we've had from the beginning that we do what? Love one another. Do you know what love is? Now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I'm writing you a new command. This is the way it is. Look at verse 6. This is love. That we walk in accordance with His commands. We have to do what He says. And this is a command as you have heard it from the very beginning, that you walk in love. So you say, you know, I just don't like her because she offends me. I don't like her because she hurt me. I don't like him because of the way he talks. I don't like him because of the way he acts. Well, my dear friend, there's a problem right there. That means you're not a part of God's family. Just, sorry. Not me speaking. You can get mad at me, and sometimes people do. But all I'm doing too is reading the Scripture. God says you're not a part of His family. You say, well, if I'm not a part of the family, I'll just walk out. Well, it just proves you were not a part of the family. <laughs> there were times that my daddy looked at me and said, you're not my kid. And I could have said, well, you're right, I'm gone. <laughs> How stupid would that have been? What was he really saying to me? You need to straighten up, boy. That's not the way you're to live. That's not what I've taught you. And there are people sometimes that look like they're bastards, false children, from a different father, because of the lifestyle that they live. And I want you to understand, my dear friend, when you do that, you do a terrible service to the church of Jesus Christ, the assembly, the dear lady that meets here. You bring an embarrassment not only to God the Father, but to the family in which you're a part of. It's serious. We need to practice Christian life. We need to practice our Christian life. The truth is that sometimes we just simply study and believe and then maybe our actions go something different. And that's a key word there that goes on fill in too. Your actions are what determines if you really love people or not. Your actions. How do you act with other people? How do you act when they're not around and you're talking about them? That reveals... Who you are, not who they are. We need to practice. John rejoiced because he in some certain way revealed that he was part of the lady's family. The elect. Belief can be pretended is your fill-in. You can pretend that you believe Jesus Christ. You can pretend that you're a Christian. You can pretend... Do you believe that people pretend to be uh, a girl when they're really a boy? Do you believe the opposite is true? Boys pretend to be a girl when they're not? Do people pretend to be a Christian when they're not? Yes. Can you think in your own mind, in your own psyche, that you are a girl when you're really not a girl? Yes, you can think that. You can get your thinking in line with that and fully come to believe that. But my does not change your sex. And neither does the fact that you pretend to be a Christian make you a Christian. We need to understand who we are, what we are. And there's only one way by which we may become a member of God's family. Jesus put it very succinctly. He says that unless you believe, believe what? Believe that He died for your sins and that you give your life to Him and that you act like it by going public. Unless you believe and are baptized, you're not a part of God's family, period. 
I can go back and look at the birth certificate and tell if I'm really a child of Harry Riddlebarger. It says it right there. It can be proven by blood work. It can be proven by a lot. But can I act like I'm not a child of Harry Riddlebarger Sr.? Yes, I can. Can I pretend that I'm a son when I'm not? Yeah, done often. There's somebody pretending that they live in Eva's house right now. Pretending they live. They've squatted in there and the police don't want to do the job and kick them out because their hands are tied because of the society that we live in today that tie their hands. That's called a civil matter and the police are only empowered to take and do criminal matters. So they can come and say, I'm sorry, but they can't do anything because it's not a criminal matter until they start destroying the house, by the way, and then they can. But the fact that they come and pretend they live there and say they pay rent, as you might have heard Eva talk about early, they've taken over her house and won't leave. And I want you to understand that people have taken over the house of God called the church today and they're pretending it's their house when God says you're not even a part of my family we're not a part of my family we believe may be pretended it can even be confessed with the lips but love is harder than just counterfeiting it that's where we get the test you see I could pretend that I'm the child of Harry Riddlebarger but when the blood test is taken and my DNA matches his, pretending is over. It's a truth then, or it's not the truth. And I want you to understand that the DNA test that is run on Christians is the way you love the members of the assembly. If you don't love them, then you're just pretending. There's something wrong with that. Look at John 14, verse 15, if you would, please. It says, If you love me, then what will you do? You will keep my commandments. That's the Bible. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit only comes to live inside of people that are truly God's child. If you say, I just cannot forgive so and so, my dear friend, you better really get a quick check on yourself because it's, you're saying you're not truly a Christian yourself. Because if you were, the Holy Spirit would come in you and you would do things you couldn't believe you could do because the DNA of God's in you and God can forgive people that you never as a human being could forgive. You say, well, I just can't forgive. Same thing. I cannot alter my DNA. You can't alter your behavior just because you claim to be a Christian, just because you've been baptized, just because you've joined the church. You can't claim to be a Christian unless you can forgive like God can forgive. That shows the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, and He's the one that's living the life, not you. We need to realize what the Scripture says. And this, He is the Spirit of truth, and the world is unable to even understand Him. The world is unable to understand the Holy Spirit Unless they have Him. You receive Him. They won't see Him. You don't feel Him. You just know it because He is with you and you will be like God. In other words, if God forgives you without anything being done on your part, then you have to forgive others just because God forgave you and it's natural. It's part of your DNA. First John Three, verse 23 follows up on that. The one who keeps his commandment is a valid Christian. The one who doesn't keep his commandment is a liar and a fake and an evil one. And he's the Antichrist, as we'll see told to us again in just a few moments. First John 3, verse 23. Now this is the command, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He commanded us. You talk about other people? You say, well, I'm just telling the truth. And the way we know that He remains in us is from the Spirit that He's given us. The Spirit 
will slap your face if you even think of doing that. The one who keeps His commands remains in Him, and He remains in them. And in this way, we know that He remains in us. It is from the Spirit that He's given us. If you say, you know, I don't know how in the world I do it, but I just don't seem to remember the offense anymore. (laughs) That's the Spirit of God living in you. We need to get back and practice what we say we believe. And first, we have to believe it by giving our life to Jesus Christ. There is a sincere love for the Bible in Christians. There is a love for all, a fill-in, all God's people. All God's people. It's circular. They love you. You love them. You can't explain it. That's what makes churches. Churches are the assembling together of people that God's Spirit lives in, and He has put you together in an assembly. You can't leave that assembly part of another assembly because God put you in that one. Did your kids ever tell you, I'm just going to go find me a new home? I'm going to get different parents. Those parents down the street are better parents than you are. You can't do it. <laughs> you just can't do it. First John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from who? God. And everyone who loves has been what? Born. You're a child of God if you love. If you say, I don't understand why I love these people. They're different than me. Then that demonstrates that you are a child of God. And the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. You can't explain God in any other way but love. You cannot explain being a Christian any other way but the fact that you love people and forgive people like God forgave you and loves you. Number two, and I close with this, you need to protect your Christian relationship. You say, what do you mean by protect your Christian relationship? It was I was a kid and I'd tell my parents, I'm leaving. I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to find me a new mother and dad. I don't want to be a part of this. You need to protect your Christian relationships. You need to protect it. There needs to be a... a an arm around, there needs to be a finger in the face, there needs to be people straightening up and saying, you're not either, you're not a Christian, or you're a sorry Christian, one or the other. Because you just can't do that if you're a Christian. And if you're a sorry Christian, you better stop and think about whether you really are a Christian or not. Jesus died for me I got to live for him. That means I got to die for some people that hurt me. Where do we come off with the fact that Jesus died for us, but I don't have to die for anybody? Where do we get such a crazy idea? We have to protect the Christian relationship we have. My daddy said that they were good people. They were good people. If the Father said they were people, the problem is with us. That's how a father acts with his child. That's how he takes and loves his child, is he loves them and forgives them and works with them because they're his DNA. They're his child. Protect your Christian relation. Let's end by looking at verses 7 through 11 as we wind down. How do you grow a healthy Christian life? Two ways. One, practice it. And two, protect your relationship. Protect those relationships that God has given you. Simply, we cannot allow ourselves to be around people that run down Jesus or people that Jesus lives in. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. You want to know when the Antichrist is coming? My dear friend, take a look around. You may be the Antichrist. Take a look around. The world's full of people that say they're Christians that do not act like Jesus. They're Antichrist, the Bible says. Watch yourself so that you don't lose what you've worked for. You see, you can take and hang around with bad people, and it won't be long before you did. You look up in Seattle right now, there's a group that has occupied uh, an area that people own businesses, they have homes, they, they've spent their whole life building. They've gone in and occupied that, and they said, we don't want any police in here to tell us what to do. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We're going to do what we want to do. Think there could be a problem if your family operated that way? And guess what? Last night, 
There were two murders that occurred in that area, and guess what they said? The police came in there and said, yes, there's murders. They told the police, get out. We don't want you in here. We'll handle our own problem. How would you like the public to be handling the problem like that? I want you to understand the church is no different. We cannot handle things in the church our way. God handles them His way. We're to love one another. We're to practice our Christian relationships. Continue reading there. Watch yourself so that you don't lose what you've worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Don't run around with people that act like that. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching, that means you don't keep doing it, keep growing in Christ's teaching, but goes beyond it, does not have God. There are a lot of people that call themselves progressive Christians today. The word progressive simply means that you evolve beyond what used to be. We're living in a world that is progressive, also called socialist. We're living in a world today where people believe, just like in Seattle, that they can just make up their own rules as they go along. They don't stay in what is established. They keep making it up every day, going a little bit different and a little bit different and a little bit different. And don't point your finger at them. We need to point our finger at ourselves in the church and see if we're not the problem in society today. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it, that's progressivism, does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, the one has both the Father, the one who will remain in that teaching is the one that has both the Father and the Son in them. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home. Do not greet him. For the one who greets him will share in his evil works. If you associate with people like that, my dear friend, if you take and say, well, I don't want to argue with them, you're participating in it. You're not only helping them to go further down, you will become like them yourself. And God tells us, the Antichrist. If you realize that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, He is an Antichrist. And the denial is this. It's not that the words don't say that. It's the way they live their life. Jesus says, love one another, forgive one another as I have forgiven you. And if we said, I can't do that. Antichrist. Antichrist. There's a, out in the, the prairie areas, when the pioneers were coming across, they did some things that in our society we practice too. Firefighters. My dad was a firefighter all the, my years and growing up and retired as a firefighter. And when you're fighting forest fires, there's a, there's a principle that has to be done, and it applies to the church too. You wonder sometimes in the church, uh, how can I get away from that? Well, you don't associate with people that do these things. Just withdraw your fellowship from them and just say, as long as you're going to do that, I'm not going to be a part of it. And if they say, well, I'll stop it, then you can remain with them. But if they start it up again, just say, I'm not going to stay here. I will not participate. If somebody starts to talk about somebody else, walk away. And if they say, I- I- I'll stop, then stay. But if you stay and listen to it, you're as guilty as they are. Here's what they do in a forest fire. When they see a forest fire coming, They know that it's going to consume every single thing that it comes to. So what they do while they're waiting on the forest fire is they take a match, they light the forest that they're standing in. Right where they're standing, they light it. And then they move away and let it burn that area. And then as soon as that area bends, they get up here and it keeps burning and it keeps burning and it keeps burning. The wider the circle it gets, they want it to get as wide as it can where they're standing so that when the flame ends and and the storms of the forest fire comes toward them. They stand there just confident, like no problem, nothing's going to happen to me because I'm standing where it's already been burnt. Sure enough, they're safe. They don't have to hide in a, in a bag. They don't have to take and, and shoot water on themselves. They literally can stand there. Now, it'll be a lot of heat there, but they won't die from it. The reason is, fire does not go where fire Fire does not go where fire has already been. So if you're at your house one day and the fire catches on and you see and you run outside and the house is on fire, don't go stand in the fire. 
If you're among friends and, and one of them begins to gossip or to take and to put down people and does not have the Spirit of God in them, they're going against what God says, they won't forgive, and you stay there with them, my dear friend, you're going to take and be consumed by the fire. It is better for you to go where the fire has been. That's where the power of God has come into a life and purged it from sin and a new life has been born. You have a new daddy. You have the Heavenly Father Himself is your Father now. And Jesus died and paid for you. And you're right now in the family of God. And you're in a protected zone. Fire does not go where the fire has been before. As I close, I uh, am reminded here in verse 11. Verse 11 says, You'll put that one back up for me again there, please. For the evil one who greets him shares in his evil ways. Verse 10 starts it. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this same teaching to you, do not receive him into your home and do not greet him. For the one who greets him shares in his evil work. Shares in his evil work. Is that what you want to be known for? It's becoming one of them. You say, well, I just couldn't stop them. I love them and they're my family. I just I can't stop this. Yes, you can. You can distance yourself and get where the fire's been, where Jesus Christ is, and be a part of that and get away from that. Several years ago in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, in uh, the United States, we, we call them cities and, and states, and uh, we call them the country, the United States. Canada is the country, and Ontario is the province, or we would call it a state here down in our area. And in the city, as we would call it, uh, of Oshawa, a fellow by the name of George and his wife Vera um, Bolzinski. They lived where things had changed. Things had gotten different. It was a normal Thursday afternoon one time and the phone rang and there'd been an accident. And Vera answered the telephone. And they said, you have to come. There's been a serious accident and your family's involved. And she ran out and they got in the car. They were scared to death and they went racing down the street to the street corner where they'd been told that the, the, the accident occurred. And as they arrived on the scene, they saw the ambulances and the fire trucks and all the different emergency vehicles out there. And they also saw a blanket on the street. And coming out from the blanket was the blood. And as Vera would say, there's the blood from my son. And it was just poured out on the street. Just a big puddle. He said, there's the blood of my son who's gone to be with Jesus. Being a Christian gives you some great insights into what's going on in the world. Non-Christians cannot understand the things that happen in this world. They have to go through tremendous grief and so many difficulties that Christians do not have to go through when they know the truth and what happens when God calls a person home. She got out of the car and she said to her husband, she said, George, there's the blood from our son. And just at that time, the car ran through the intersection and splash, splash, as the car ran through the intersection and splattered the blood from their son. He wanted to get out and take the person in that car apart. But they realized that that was not their son anymore. That was the blood that that son had when he was alive here. But now he was with Jesus. They hurt. They grieved. They didn't think they would make it through. But Vera, for the first time in her life, realized what it was like when Jesus' blood was spilled on the ground so that she could go to heaven when she died. Vera realized for the first time that day, seeing her son's blood on the ground and how it just ripped her apart, what God felt like when His son's blood was spilled on the ground so that Vera... And her husband George and their son could go and be with Jesus, not because of anything they deserve and not because of any circumstances, but because Jesus has said, Your turn, come on up. 
My dear friend, you and I do not know the day or the hour when God will call us home. Before we meet again, God could call one of us home. The question is, have you accepted the blood that Jesus spilt for you and given up your life? Is it evident by the congregation that you're a part of that you love one another in such a way that when someone walks in and you identify them as a Christian and and they said, hold it, you might not like me. And you said, if you're a Christian, I love you. And you might not like something I'm doing. And you still look at them and say, it doesn't matter what you're doing, my dear friend. What matters is if the blood of Jesus Christ runs in your veins. You're my brother, you're my sister. What effect would that have on this church if that's the way people were greeted when they came in here? And if somebody comes in here and looks at you like, I don't know what you're talking about. You look at them and say, Woo, as you say it to yourself, i got a chance now to win somebody to Jesus. God didn't make me go out and walk the streets as Pastor Sat used to do. He sent them to me. They're going to sit on a pew in the church. I have a chance to sit down and love them and share with them and see them give their life to Jesus because Jesus died for them the same as He died for me. And we don't judge their sin. We judge their forgiveness in Jesus Christ. They belong to the body of Christ. Oh, my dear friend, you want to get a healthy Christian life? Then practice, practice, practice. Would you stand together with me? Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Jesus who died and made it possible for us to have the very blood of Jesus Christ running through our veins. (laughs) No longer the DNA of my dad, But now the DNA of my Heavenly Father's Son, Jesus Christ, flows in me. Thank You, Lord, for providing that gift to me. May I never trample on it by not loving and forgiving, which is the classic sign of a true Christian distinguished from an antichrist. Lord, give me the heart and the love for somebody that does not know You. Bring them to know You. By my love for them, I love to win them to Jesus. Give me a burden and a heart, Lord, to win somebody to Jesus this very day. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we sing a song,